Thank you guys again for joining us. Uh, if you've been with us over the past few weeks, uh, the three weeks to be exact, we are in Acts part one. So uh, this is uh, actually week four of Acts part one. It's a lot of numbers, right? Uh, but what this is, is we have decided as a church, you know, we felt led by the Lord to jump into the book of Acts. And if you know anything about the book of Acts, it's rather large <laughs> in its content and its chapters. And so it takes time to get through them. And we wanted to make sure that we're actually spending time in, this, in the Lord's word in this specific book and breaking down what it is that God has there for us. And so uh, we have been doing that. And this will probably be something, a series that leads into um, next year. And it's not going to be consistent. That's why it says part one. So we're in part one right now. We'll take a break, if you will, which just means we're going to jump into other series and different topics and stuff. And uh, towards the, the, the middle of the year, summer probably, we'll go to Acts part two and so on and so forth. And so just want to make sure we're getting into all of God's word because all of God's word is good. Amen? Amen. And God's got some good stuff for us in all of his word. So uh, if you were here a few weeks ago, week one, Pastor Josh kicked off uh, this series and he talked through the necessity of clarity in God's word. You remember his conversation on uh, scripture being prescriptive or descriptive and how it's important for us to recognize the difference there so that we read it and aren't taking some things that God never intended for us to take literally, literally. And we're like, I got to live this way. And God's like, I never said that. You know what I mean? There's things there that we got to be careful of and also things that God is calling us to that we might be missing. And then week two, he gave us a deeper look uh, at the Holy Spirit in our lives, the spirit of God and all the goodness that is and dwells within the spirit of God when he dwells within us. Um, the gift of the Holy Spirit to us. And then week three, he led us through a conversation about unity, which we all need. Amen? Amen. We need to be unified and how that's hard, but it's what Jesus has for us and to pursue that unity amongst one another. So to say the least, there's a lot of different things going on here, right? Like the, the book of Acts is like that friend who just like, he tells you a story, but he jumps to like a thousand different places before he gets to the end. That's it. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to follow in that today and we're going to jump into chapter three. And I hope you don't have plans for this evening because we're going to go verse by verse, all 26 of them. No, but we are going to take some time and read through it and just break it down so that we get an idea of what's actually going on here. So I want to start off by giving you some context. Context is important uh, to understand the background of what's happening in this moment uh, so we can see God's bigger picture for us. So first thing is we've got two guys uh, in this chapter, in chapter three of Acts, and their names are Peter and John, okay? These disciples, these followers of Jesus. Uh, and Peter and John are on their way to the temple for prayer. So as they're on their way to the temple for prayer, just give you some, some details here. Uh, the, the, uh, the temple was there for prayer and for sacrifice people to go in and hang out. Their church service times were three times a day uh, for prayer. And the first one was early morning. The second one was mid-afternoon. And then the third was evening. And so what it, what it was believed is that the day started with that first prayer time at 6 a.m. And the scripture says that Peter and John went into the ninth hour of the day, which would put them at the mid-afternoon prayer time. And I just, I think that's so cool. These are followers of Jesus who, who obviously know, and they, 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 they know that Jesus has come and he's accomplished, right? He's fulfilled the law and that, that you don't want to get tied up in, in religious duties and just checking boxes and saying, I went to church today, things like that. But they know the value of going and sitting in the temple with the Lord and spending time and praying and talking to him. And so you see these huge guys in the faith still doing this thing and going there. Well, while they're on their way there, they get to the gate and there is uh, what the Bible refers to as the lame beggar at the gate. So I had that in my notes and we, I, like one of the people in the booth was like, dude, why'd you call that guy lame? And I was like, dude, that's what the verse, it's the scripture, right? Uh, and what they're referring to is there's a man who is crippled and he cannot walk. Uh, and every day people would carry this man from his home to the gates of the temple so that he could ask for alms, right? So he could ask for, for uh, support and so he can ask for people to give him money to support him, to meet his needs um, because he was unable to do it due to him being lame. And so he's at the gates and he, Peter and John walk up to the gates and they see this man and he's asking for this. And there's this really cool moment where we're gonna pick up in scripture when Peter and John see this beggar. So here's Acts 3 verse four. It says, Peter and John looked at him intently and Peter said, look at us. Just love like the intense, you know, Peter. It's just like, I picture him saying it in like a Batman voice, you know, look at us, you know. The lame man looked at them eagerly expecting, that's pretty good guys. I'm a, uh, looked at them eagerly expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have, right? She's like, hold on. He's like, you guys have money for me. No, we don't. I've got something different for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. 
So again, Peter's got this intense stare. Him and John, you know, they got this moment of like, yeah, this guy doesn't need money. He needs something even better, right? And so they, they, they sit there, look at us, make eye contact. This, this moment becomes intimate, right? Becomes real, becomes an authentic moment between them and the beggar. And he doesn't get the money, but he gets something better. Pick up in verse seven. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly, everybody say instantly, instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. All the people there saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. Last week, Josh kind of dug into the layout of the temple and there's this place underneath some columns. It's a covered roof and it's good for acoustics, keeps you out of the weather, all that. So they walk into this space with this man and they see, holy cow, this is the man that was at the gate. Like five minutes ago, if I just walked in, I saw that guy sitting down because he could not walk and he was asking for money. That's the same guy who was now not just walking, but leaping for joy and praising God. What is going on? Can you imagine, right? Just being there and seeing this guy, you would be shocked. Instantaneous healing. Again, from birth is what the scripture says. From birth, he could not walk, right? And you're telling me in a matter of a second, this man's muscles, his bones, his body healed to the point that he could get up and he could jump and praise God. It's insane, right? Praise God for that. So these people see that and they flock to see. Obviously they would. So all this happens and Peter recognizes something, something different. Okay? Peter's focus is not necessarily on that, but he recognizes the reaction of the people, right? The people are flocking to them, to him and John, and they're recognizing this guy and they're, they're, they're conversing and, and they're staring in amazement. And he begins to see that they're looking at him and John as if they did this. You're like, well, they did, right? They did. But what they start to do is they start to give them the glory. Wow, you guys must be just amazing. You guys must be so powerful. Look at what they did for this lame beggar. Look at what they did. So Peter sees this and he recognizes that it's an issue. So here's how he responds to the people's amazement at them. Uh, verse 12, Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate. Despite Pilate's decision to release him, you rejected this holy, righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Amen. Huge, right? So Peter takes a second and goes, hold on. He does a few things here, okay? A few things. First, he's like, you need to understand you're standing in amazement and that's great, but don't look at us in amazement, look at him, right? Jesus gets the glory through the Father. The Father has worked through the Son to bring healing to this man, right? Jesus has the power. Jesus has the authority. Jesus is the one who makes a difference. Amen. It is Jesus' power through Peter and John that has made this man walk and leap and give God praise. So Peter says, don't forget that. John and I, normal men, human beings, just like all of you, who have an opportunity through faith in Jesus to be used to do mighty things as well. Amen. Amen. So he reminds them of this. He makes sure that they see this. And again, you read this and you're like, all right, Peter, I, I hear what you're saying, man. But like, this guy's walking. Like, you got to bring correction right now. You know what I mean? Like, can we not just celebrate this guy jumping around? This guy who's able to walk when he hasn't been able to his whole life. So again, maybe it's just Peter wants to be humble, right? He wants to make sure that God gets the glory, that Jesus has the glory there. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think, right? Yeah. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. We could park this, this sermon right there and we could talk on the, on the mighty power of God and how there's nothing that compares to him or his ways or his authority or anything like that, right? 
We could sit there and we could read scripture on top of scripture on top of scripture that would blow our minds about how mighty and how good God is, right? And Peter recognizes that and he wants these people he's seeing and talking to to recognize that as well. But I think there's more. I think we have to keep moving forward because of what else Peter says, if you continue on past the, hey, it was Jesus, he gets the glory. What does he remind them of? Hey, by the way, you killed Jesus. Peter, did anybody ever tell you you don't bring up the past, bro? You know what I mean? Like, why, why are you saying this? We're all having a good time. Yeah, you just ruined the vibe, Peter, right? He's like, yeah, you killed the author of life. You did. You people. He's talking to them. You guys did this, right? You took the Son of God and placed him on a cross. Peter, why are you doing Peter needs a nap. You know what I mean? Like, why are you so frustrated in the middle of the afternoon, it actually would be a good nap time, right? 3 p.m. So what is it? What is Peter's actual why? Because he's not just coming in angry. Maybe Peter needs a nap, but that's not the reason he's responding this way. There is more to it. So if we continue in the passage, I think there'll be some, some clarity for us. Verse 17, Peter again. Friends, I realize that you and your leaders did to Jesus, what you, what you and your leaders, excuse me, did to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. And so Peter, in a moment, he brings them some heavy truth, right? You killed the author of life. You put him on the cross. You guys turned him over to Pilate. You traded him out with a murderer. You chose a murderer. You chose Barabbas over Jesus. Also, here's some grace. You were ignorant, right? There was ignorance there. There was a lack of understanding there. And ultimately, this was God's plan all along to save his people. It was God's will that we would be close, his desire that we would have an opportunity to be close to him and he was gonna make a way. So now, verse 19, repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah, for he must remain in heaven until the time for the final rest restoration of all things as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. And then to verse 26, when God raised up his servant, Jesus, he sent him first to you people of Israel to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. We know that Jesus goes on and, and, and the word of Jesus goes on, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles, to all people, right? To have an opportunity to enter into relationship with Jesus, to be saved from his work on the cross for us. So Peter's response why does Peter respond the way that he does? Why, is, why does Peter come at them with such hard truth and some grace? What, what's his goal here? I think Peter's got two goals. First off, Peter's response is based on who he's talking to. So I skipped a, a section of verses there between 21 and 26. So 20 through, 22 through 25 is Peter talking about what he says at the end of 21. He must re remain in heaven for the time until the final restoration of all things as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. So in those next verses, what he does is Peter lists off these holy prophets he's referring to, these heroes of the faith in the Old Testament. Why does he do that, right? So he talks about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and Samuel in those verses after. For what reason? Because again, where is he? He's in the temple. And who's he with? He's with Jewish people who know the Bible. He's with all these people who know God's word. They know the Old Testament. They know of these people he's referring to. Again, heroes of the faith. He's like, I know, people are like, I know who Moses is. I know who Samuel is. I know who all these people are, right? He's like, well, if you know who they are, then you should know what they said. Because what they said is Jesus is coming. There's a Messiah who's gonna change everything. And they're like, wait, did he? Did they say that? right? And Peter sees that based on their response to him and the man being healed. He's like, you guys are missing something. You know these things. So I can relate with you. I can remind you of, of these prophecies that God placed long ago. Like verse 25, you are the children of those prophets and you are included in the covenant God promised to your ancestors. For God said to Abraham, through your descendants, all the families on earth will be blessed. Yes, we'll be blessed. And he's like, no, no, you don't get it. You'll be blessed in Jesus name from the sun coming and making everything new, changing every single thing, you're missing it, right? Jesus was the plan from the very beginning. They did not see or understand the bigger picture. And so that's Peter's second part. The second part of Peter's goal is to get these people, these Jews in the temple to see the light and to understand. Understand the truth behind God's word here. If you're to spark note it, Peter's saying, y'all need Jesus and you don't even see it, right? You need Jesus and you don't even see it. They had knowledge, but whether by choice, ignorance, confusion, incorrect teaching, or, or, or whatever it may be, they failed to understand and believe and accept Jesus as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world. There was a disconnect there. Here's what they really failed to see, and Peter needed them to see this. This is why he comes at them, right? 
They failed to see their responsibility. They failed to see their responsibility in the chains that were placed on his body. Who placed the chains? They did. Peter says, you guys placed the chains on Jesus. They wrongfully, illegally placed him on trial and accused him. They took him before Pilate. Peter says, they chose a murderer over him. They were responsible for Jesus being placed on the cross for the beatings that he took. They were responsible for his death. You killed the author of life and you need to be aware of that. That's what he's saying to them. You guys did this. You need to see that. You need to feel the weight of that. That's heavy stuff, right? Good news is Peter doesn't stop there, amen? But wait, there's more, right? <laughs> what they also failed to see, and Peter sees this and he reminds them in that moment, says, hey, there was ignorance and this was God's will. He says, don't forget that in the midst of that, what you're also failing to see is the love of God all throughout it. The plan of God, his care for you all throughout it. See, it was actually their debt to be paid, but because of your sin, Jesus stepped in and because he loves you, he took your place on the cross. All those places we just listed, he's saying you were supposed to be in those spots. Jesus said otherwise. He said, I'll take your spot. I'll stand, I'll take your debt on myself. Because one day, God's son, completely innocent of any and all sin, would come and willingly take the place of all of them, like Peter said, he did and carry all of the sin, become sin himself for them, for every single one of them. Peter said, you've got to see this. The truth is there. And you did these things. You were responsible for the death of Jesus, right? There's responsibility there. But there's also grace. 2 Corinthians 5.21 said, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. As Peter says, there's an opportunity for you to have your sins blotted out, removed, made clean, and it would come at no cost for them, a free gift from God out of his love for them. Do you see the grace, church? The truth is there, the hard truth, but do you see the grace that follows? The grace of God the Father to his people. And all that we need to do, like Peter says, is repent, turn around, hit a 180, go the other way, go towards the Father, go towards Jesus, let him be Lord, experience life with him and all that he has to offer and watch how he changes everything. So if you read on into chapter four, which we'll get into next week, uh, it says that Peter's sermon, this was his second sermon in the, in, in the book of Acts that he digs into just back to back, right? And in the second sermon after this, he, him and John actually end up getting arrested. But when that's all going on, uh, it says that the total number of believers that day added up to around 5,000 people. Insane, right? And that's not 5,000 in that one moment. And if you remember back in chapter two, uh, after his first sermon, it says that three, around 3,000 people came to know Jesus, right? 3,000 people got saved. So the Lord done used Peter to snatch up another 2,000, y'all. That's what happened. That's huge, right? Praise God. Thousands of people heard this and like, oh yeah, I feel the weight. I understand the truth. I see the grace. So we're in here and we're like, all right, cool. Who's that for? Them, right? That was cool to hear about Acts 3 and all that. Like, but what's that got to do with me today? Everything. Amen. Everything for all of us. If you look at Peter's sermon as a whole, he brings two things, again, to the Jewish people. The truth and the grace for everyone. Us as well. How is the truth and the grace for me? See, Jesus did not only take the place of those in the temple that day with Peter and John, Jesus did not only take the place of those that were part of God's Israel, Jesus took my place too. Jesus took your place. Jesus took all of our places on the cross. He stepped in when we were supposed to. Here's the reality. We are guilty. We are guilty of our sin. We deserve the cross. That was our place to stand, right? Just like the Jewish people, we often forget that. We, we often miss the weight of why Jesus had to hang on the cross, why Jesus had to die. And we fail to understand or see the value that's placed on his grace because of all that he's done for us. I mean, and there's a lot of reasons why. We, we, we can come up with a lot of excuses if we're being honest, a lot of different lies that we might believe to convince us like, I'm, that wasn't me, All right? I'm, like, I don't know, I'm probably not. I'm not them. But like, take this, here's the first, first one. 
I didn't kill Jesus. It wasn't me. I wasn't one of the people there, right? The Jewish people and the Romans did way back. It's 2024. Pastor Ricky, I wasn't there. I didn't kill Jesus. Romans 3, 23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Everyone falls short, right? Uh, yeah, okay, maybe I'm a sinner, maybe, but I can guarantee you I'm not as bad as they are, right? That's a real one. Do you see them? Look at them. Just rough. Bad choices. Every, like, I'm not that. James 2.10, for the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. Yep. Pump the brakes, right? Like, that doesn't make sense. It's right there. <laughs> it's real, right? Comparison trap. Oh, I'm, I'm not them, though. God says you're guilty, too. The word of God brings truth to us. We are guilty. Our sin is there. All right, well, maybe I know, I know I'm a sinner, but here's the deal. Because of Jesus, I'm forgiven, so let's party on, brother, right? Let's go crazy. Romans 6, 6, well, then should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Amen. Here's the truth. I'm broken. You're broken. We're all broken. We're sinners. And we are all responsible for Jesus, right? If Ricky Bustos had not sinned, there would not be, right? If we all had this saying, if I had not sinned, there would not be a reason for Jesus to have gone on the cross. Feel the weight of that, right? But we did, and we are. Here's what I'm not trying to do today, church. I'm not trying to make you feel awful about yourself. You're like, well, you're doing a good job, right? <laughs> it's not the goal of today. The goal is not that we just feel so low and so depleted and so just that, that we learn to hate ourselves. That's never the goal. And that's not the Father's heart for you, by the way. And we're gonna get into that, but we have to feel the weight. We have to feel the responsibility that is there for the cross, our choices. Why? Why, why does this matter? Here's Matthew 9, uh, verses 12 and 13. So it says, I'll, I'll give some context after. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices, for I have come to call those, not those, excuse me, who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Amen. I'm here for those who know that they're a mess. I'm here for those who know they need help, that they're sick and they need a doctor. So in this moment, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees because the Pharisees see Jesus hanging out with people who seem suspect in their eyes. They're like, Jesus is hanging out with Matthew and a bunch of other tax collectors and sinners like, ew, you know what I mean? They're, being, they're like, it's nasty. Why are you spending time with them, Jesus? Eating food with them. Why would you do that? Do you know their reputation? Do you know what they've done? Do you know who they are? And this is how Jesus responds. I've come for those who know they are broken. Why is it so important for us to know that we are broken? Again, it feels... And it feels like there's some heaviness there, right? Like, is it, is it to make us feel bad again or to just to make us feel so low for those that know they are broken? Here's what I think Jesus is pushing us towards. I think Jesus knows that us hearing the hard truth can bring some good change. Hearing the hard truth can bring some change to us. So I, I've, I've uh, I think a couple years ago I shared this story, but it, it, again, was on my heart so heavy for this sermon, and so I wanted to bring it back up. But um, I... Uh, have a, he's basically like my dad to me. His name's Reed. It's my best friend's dad. My senior year, I got to live with them. Uh, they invited me in to stay with them. And uh, yeah, I became their family. Um, they, they consider me a son. Reed and Christy are their names. And Reed looks at me like a son. And um, he is grandpa. And his wife, Christy, is uh, grandma to, or he's papa. Excuse me. We got the names, right? Papa. Papa and grandma to our kiddos. Like we're, we're family. Uh, well, uh, Rachel and I had, uh, my wife Rachel and I had our, our kiddos pretty Pretty young, I'll just say that, right? And uh, we, at least I'll say, not for her, Rachel's amazing. I had no idea what I was doing, okay? Um, I had a lot to learn, still do. Um, well, after we had gotten married, I believe I was, I was 19 years old, and uh, Rachel had just had our son Liam, and there was a night that they were at home, Liam and Rachel were at home, and they both were not feeling well. Um, and uh, I can't remember the exact reason. I think it was to pick something up. I went over to Reed's house to see my friend Colin and to pick something up to take back home. Well, Colin and another friend were there. And so we're standing on Reed's back porch and we just got to chatting, you know, just having a conversation. And I had a sick wife and a sick baby at home and I'm just hanging out with my friends, just chilling like nothing's wrong in the world, right? And, uh, you know, stayed there for way too long. And all of a sudden I hear the back gate open. They, they use their back gate, never the front door. It's like a, like, 
a TV show, you know, like a sitcom. Everybody just uses the back gate. It's really cool. But they came in and they used to, Reed, Reed comes in. He's got this really stern look on his face. I'm like, man, he doesn't look too happy. And so I'm just like, what's up, reader? That's what I say to him. I, say, I call him reader. I'm like, what's up, reader? And he doesn't say anything. He just kind of stands for a second. He looks at me. He goes, you've got a sick wife and a sick baby at home and you're standing here on my porch. Just, yeah. Right? He's calling, he's standing, he's like, I think he's mad. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you might be right. You're standing here on my porch. And then he walked away. He just walked inside. I, could have, I just kind of stood there shocked. And I'm not gonna lie, I went home and I was frustrated. And I, like, I wanted to be angry at him. But after talking to my wife and asking for forgiveness and just honestly just crying and being like, I'm a piece of crap feeling that for a second, I realized the change that needed to happen. The hard truth can bring change, amen? Sometimes we need to be told the truth to realize there's an issue that needs to be changed in the first place. That's how we know it. The truth brings things in the light. And I needed that from Reed. I needed needed to start stepping in. I may have been young and I may have been just like, just out of high school, all kinds of stuff, but I needed that truth so I can start becoming the husband that God had called me to be, the father he had called me to be. Something needed to change and sometimes the hard truth is what brings that change. Here's the goal I think that Jesus has for us, right? Jesus says this because he wants us to recognize that we're not all that. We don't have it all together. I heard somebody the other day go, we're not all that in a slice of cheese. I don't even know what that means, (laughs) but I'm gonna use it. Church, you need to hear it today. You're not all that in a slice of cheese, man. You're like, that makes no sense. Put it in your notes. We're not all that. And the purpose is not to tear us down or make us feel like nothing or to feel hated or to hate ourselves, but instead to bring the change that we need to lead us in the direction that the Father has for us in order that we may be lifted up by God, made new by God. I've got to recognize my brokenness. So what kind of impact and change can recognizing my brokenness with the Lord bring? That disconnect there. Why is it important to see that? I've got two things for you. The first one, recognizing my brokenness leads to reliance. Recognizing my brokenness, my brokenness leads to reliance. In other words, it pushes me to see that I am a sinner in need of a savior. I need help. I need God's help. I need the healer, right? I have a mess that I cannot clean up by myself. Ephesians 2.8 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. A gift from God. I don't know if you know how gifts work, but they're freely given. You did nothing to earn that gift. It's just given to you. God is the one who has done the work for us. And we often forget this and attempt to become the people that God has called us to be our own way, in our own power, in our own authority that we think we've got, right? And we strive and we strive and we strive and we check the box after box after box, but so many of those days are spent trying and trying and trying for nothing because the void is still there, the emptiness is still there. We're left unsatisfied, something's just not working, the change isn't coming because we're not relying on who we should be relying on. We recognize we're so broken that we can't fix ourselves. we know we've gotta go somewhere else. Lord, I need you, right? We've gotta rely on the one who knows the way, who knows how to get it all done, who knows how and where to get us there. How many of y'all are people who like to think you can drive without a GPS? Be honest, come on. No, hey, come on. Next service, lying. That's what we're talking about in church. (laughs) That's what we're changing it up. Come on. Thanks for the honesty. I do it too sometimes. So I I know how to get there, right? Like we've got it. I've got friends who do this all the time and I'm riding with them. They're like, yeah, I I got it. You don't do it. I'm like, dude, we're going to be, it's going to be four hours and it's a four minute drive because you don't know what you're doing, right? But we think that way with the Lord. Like I can get there when there's an opportunity, something that was made to help us get there. That is our God. We can rely on him. He's like, I'll I'll show you which path to take. Matter of fact, I'll get you there the fastest. You know what I mean? I've got all the benefits in the the midst of it. You just trust me. Follow my path that I have for you, my way for you. We got to listen to the voice that helps the most. Siri. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Proverbs 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. Josh is going to fire me for that one. And he will show you which path to take. Do you hear that? He will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Then you will have healing for your body and strength for your bones. The change that comes when we rely on the Father and we trust his way and say, I can't do this without you. I'll get lost. I'll end up in more brokenness, God. I need your help. 
This is really a, a picture of, of humility that we're called to with the, with the Father, right? James 4.10, I don't have a slide for this, but humble yourselves before the Lord, right? And he will lift you up in honor. Amen. Trust his way and he will get you where you need to be. When I recognize that I'm broken, when I recognize a need for a savior, that I'm sick and I need a doctor and I choose to rely on him, he brings good change that I could not bring myself, amen? amen. Point number two, recognizing my brokenness emphasizes grace. An exclamation mark on grace itself. It makes it bigger and bolder, all caps. First Timothy 1, 9. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan from the beginning, before the beginning of time to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. Like I mentioned before, the goal of feeling the weight is not that we would feel condemned, right? There's no condemnation for those who are now in Christ Jesus. That is not God's heart for us. That's not the goal ever. And we shouldn't push each other to feel that at all either. But to become and to realize our need for his grace and how great his grace truly is, right? When we say recognize our brokenness, we're saying get that truth, receive the truth of the mess that's within us, that's around us, right? Because the greatness of God's grace is often magnified in the presence of truth. We may see God's grace and like, yeah, he saved me in eternity. It's like, God's like, you don't understand. My grace is so mighty. I've got so much for you right now. But you got to understand that there's also a mess that needs to be cleaned up right now. I've got things I'm doing right here, right now within you, in your heart. Let the truth come in and let it magnify God's grace. Let it make it bigger than we ever could have seen it. Here, here's how we see it, right? And, and what Paul is trying to get us to see in this chapter. It says the truth from Paul here is we didn't deserve to be saved, right? Again, you did not deserve that. You did not earn it. You did not achieve it, and the grace, it's given anyway. Amen. You did nothing to get it, and it's available. You did not work hard for it and finally say, I've, I've obtained it because of my hard work. God had it, and he said, here you go. Back to Peter. You killed the author of life. Let's be real, real honest. Who did? Not just them. We did. Every single one of us killed the author of life, right? You did, I did. Again, we've got to feel the weight. Think of it like this. I am the Pharisee. I am the Roman soldier. I'm the person in the crowd while Jesus was on trial who, who wanted his blood spilled, who wanted to see him killed. I'm the person who took him to Pilate. I'm the one who mocked him, who beat him, who spit on him, who punched at him, the one who placed the crown on his head and put the nails in his wrist and in his feet. That's me. That's you. That's us, right? We are those people. Like, dang, that's hard. It is. It's very hard. But it is so, it's so, so very real because here's the truth. We are those people, and yet you are loved by God. It's like, God, I did this to you. And he's like, I know. I love you so much. It's like, God, I, I hurt you. I'm the reason you had to get up on that cross. He's like, I know. And I would do it over again for you. You matter so much and I love you so much and I wanna be so close to you. I love you. Here's the point. Sometimes it takes remembering the weight that we once carried to truly understand the value of what's been lifted off. Does that make sense? Sometimes it takes remembering the bondage, the chains that we were in to truly understand and experience the freedom that's been given to us. I was once here and this is where the Lord has brought me. Do you see that? But to remember here makes all the difference here. Amen? Amen. Sometimes it takes hearing the truth of what we really deserved to truly appreciate and recognize the wonderful grace that's been gifted to us. It means so much more. We understand it. We understand God's love for us and see how it is so much bigger than we actually understand. A way to summarize this. So I am not innocent of the shed blood of Jesus, but the shed blood of Jesus makes me innocent in the eyes of God, my father. Amen. Right? I am not innocent, but Jesus has made me so simply through his love and grace for me. And it's an opportunity to receive that. He does not force it. He offers it to me. God is good. Living in this changes everything. Last thing for you. And then we're going to get some baptisms, y'all. We're going to get rowdy in here. One more thing. A step that we can be taking. 
With all this in mind, seek the truth. Seek out the hard truth from your father. So there's a, a passage, you guys know about this. You guys know the moment with David and, and the prophet Nathan, where the prophet Nathan comes in and we're gonna have people moving. That's because baptism's getting ready. We're getting excited, guys. It's gonna be great. David sees Bathsheba and all the things that come with that, right? And after David has done this thing, after he has sinned, Nathan, the prophet, is sent in by God to bring uh, accountability and correction and truth to David. And he does exactly that. Well, after that, there's this psalm where David just, he, 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 he receives the truth from God and he asks for more of it. He asks for change from the Father. And he says in Psalm 51, verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Do not banish me from your pre presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Bring the truth to me, God. Clean me up, make me new. Keep bringing it to me, God, because I wanna be more like you. I wanna be the person you've called me to be. I don't wanna be stuck in my own ways, doing my own things, God. I don't wanna be lost. I wanna be found. I wanna be who you want me to be. So bring it, God. We gotta be like David. And those are hard prayers, right? Those are hard things to ask the Lord. God, reveal the truth. Come and tell me what I'm not doing right, God. Come and tell me of the places that I have yet to give you, Lord, to invite you into, Lord. Come in and clean it all up. Let your will be done, God. Your way over mine. Your desire for me over mine. What you think and know is right versus what I think is right. Have your way. Be Lord, Jesus. Seek the truth. And it's a scary ask for sure. But we know that when he brings the truth, it's him loving us. When he brings the truth, he's bringing grace. When he brings the truth, he's bringing change. Things that are gonna make us better than we could have ever been without him. He brings refreshment, like Peter said, restoration, because he loves us, amen? Church, you wanna stand up? I'm gonna pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you. Thank you for your grace, God. Thank you for caring for us the way that you do. Thanks for getting our attention, Lord. And sometimes you do it with some truth, God, that is so hard sometimes, but it's so good because it gives us what we need, God. You give us what we need. And I pray that today we do that. Guys, while we're still praying, I, I, wanna, I wanna encourage you in this and you can keep your, your heads bowed and your eyes closed. But maybe for you, this whole conversation has just been brand new. We talk about the, the truth that God brings, but the grace of God that is for all of us and how we hold a responsibility. And yet God says, I love you anyways. Maybe you've never heard that before. And today is a new day with that. What I wanna encourage you to do is if you've never made Jesus Lord of your life, if you never received the grace that he has for you, if you recognize that truth and you feel the weight, but you want to be in right standing with the Lord, you wanna receive the grace and forgiveness, the life change that comes only through Jesus Christ, today is another opportunity. Every day is an opportunity to lean into that. And so I encourage you in this time, as we pray, as we celebrate baptisms, as we worship, meet with God. Invite Jesus in to be Lord. I can promise you that he will never, ever, ever let you down. He's always available, always ready, always willing, and he will always love you. Jesus, we thank you for this time. I pray that people, all of us, Lord, we lean into you. Thank you for your love for us. God, you're worthy of all the praise again. It's in your powerful and perfect name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. We're going to worship.